My name is Katie Rogers, and I'm here today in two capacities um, as the Programs Director and Director of the Robert Motherwell Catalog Resume Project here at the Daedalus Foundation, and also as the President, as the president of the Catalog Resume Scholars Association. So I'm pleased to welcome you in both capacities today for what will surely be two very exciting days. Um, so I wanted to give you a little context for anyone who hasn't been to Daedalus first. Um, so Daedalus was created by the American abstract expressionist painter Robert Motherwell. Um, Motherwell passed in 1991 and had spent about a decade thinking about a foundation. Um, it was originally called the Robert Motherwell Foundation and later he changed it to Daedalus shortly before his death. Um, and he changed it to Daedalus um, after Stephen Daedalus and James Joyce in order to reflect our mission that we are supporting modern art and modernist principles in addition to Motherwell's legacy. So that includes for us this type of program where we are creating a space for dialogue and really helping other really worthy um, organizations and programs have a platform and a space to present that sort of um, discussion and exploration. So that's what today is. That's why you're in a painter's foundation talking about sculpture. <laughs> So um, this conference really came out of conversations I had with Sharon Hecker. Um, Sharon and I started talking maybe a year and a half ago or so about her work on Medardo Rosso, and she'll be presenting some of that today. And um, it was really exciting what she was talking about. And as you can see, um, so many people are interested in this topic of posthumous casts. So Sharon did so much of the, the legwork on this. I am so grateful to her. She was an incredible partner. Um, did so much of the intellectual heavy lifting. So we at Daedalus are so happy to host her here. And I want to just, I want to thank um, the Daedalus staff before we start to George Erickson, who will be doing all of our tech support today, um, and Julie Famvu, who put together the, um, the list and the catering and all of that. So this couldn't have happened without our staff here. Um, so I will speak very briefly because we have such a full day. Um, I'd like to introduce Sharon Hecker, who will really set the tone for this conference. Um, and so Sharon will be followed by various panels throughout the day. Each of you has a program. Um, we'll break for lunch. Lunch is on your own on the back of this program. There are some suggestions nearby for a, a Fairly quick lunch, we hope, since we'd like everyone to be back on time so we can stay on schedule wherever possible. Um, and at the end of the program, you can also see bios for many of the speakers or for all of the speakers. Um, so we'll be able to have kind of abbreviated introductions, also being sensitive to the fact that these are long days. So each panel has, most of them have three panelists. We have uh, one with four and one with two right now. Um, and, the mod and a moderator who will run each panel. So each presenter will give presentations and there will be some space for Q&A afterward. Um, and just housekeeping for anyone who wasn't here, um, there are restrooms at the back of the space and two behind this wall here. So I'm very excited to introduce Sharon Hecker, who um, I, I couldn't have asked for a better partner in crime for this, so thank you. So a very warm welcome to everybody who's here. I'm, I'm so... Uh grateful that so many people showed up for a, a topic that we thought was actually highly specialized and would interest only a very few people. So um, my deepest, deepest gratitude goes to Katie Rogers, my co-organizer, who has been fantastic from the start. Uh, the Catalog Raisin Day Scholars Association and the Daedalus Foundation have provided every kind of uh, support that we needed to put such a complex conference together. Uh, a special thanks to all the speakers and moderators and the audience, so many of you who have come from so far away uh, to participate today. And this promises to be a very exciting two-day presentation and discussion of posthumous casts. This conference, uh, just a bit of history, grew out of my considerations of the work of the sculptor Medardo Rosso, which led to an essay I published in 2017 uh, in the Journal of Art Historiography called uh, The Afterlife of Sculptures. 
The essay generated numerous discussions among many colleagues from different fields, art historians, curators, lawyers, legal scholars, collectors, dealers, art market operators. There was just a flurry of emailing going on after that uh, essay came out. And out of that, the conference was born. We just decided, why don't we all get together and discuss it together instead of separately? So I'd like to sort of uh, open with an example. And I'm not going to say too much about the images, but it's just to get your eyes used to some of the issues that we are going to be discussing today using one case study. Um, and this is where my essay began. In 1996, uh, Tate discovered that a sculpture by Rosso in its collection labeled Grand Rieuse, which was hitherto considered a lifetime cast, was actually a posthumous cast made under the auspices of the artist's sons, Francesco. The museum website um, reports that this new attribution posed a challenge to the object's, quote, authenticity. Uh, and it raised questions about its, quote, status and value. Uh, Tate evidently felt that a posthumous cast was less desirable and um, suitable for exhibition. At the time of the acquisition in 1986, there had been no reason for Tate to doubt what it called the cast's authenticity, presumably meaning its status as a lifetime cast. The object had come directly from the descendants of the artist via a reputable dealer. It was accompanied by a signed bill of sale from Rosa's granddaughter in which she guaranteed the work as, quote, authentic cast by her grandfather. She also inscribed the back and the bottom of the cast itself with the names and words, work by Medardo Rosso. Such a guarantee of authorship highlights how broadly the concept of authenticity can be interpreted in the case of a posthumous cast. Grand Rieuse, is a um, cast made legally by Rosso's son from the artist's plaster models, but possibly using different materials and techniques from those used by his father. And here's just to show you the posthumous one in the middle and two lifetime casts in different materials on the sides. And I'll leave those up for a while so you can look at them. Tate's concerns about its cast authenticity were further validated by the 2007 catalog Raisonné of Rosso's oeuvre, which separated into different sections the plaster, wax, and bronze casts believed to be by Medardo from those that were cast by others from his plaster models after his death. Authors Paola Mola and Fabio Bitucci emphasized differences in quality between what they called original and authentic lifetime casts and posthumous copies or reproductions by his son. And I quote, of an inferior quality beyond any comparison with the works by Medardo Rosso, these works by Francesco are regularly confused with the originals to the point where even in public collections, we frequently find them next to each other without any indication that lets one distinguish the authentic ones from the copies, totally legal, but always posthumous reproductions. Lest certain relaxed forms, certain deaf yellows overlap with the perception of the liveliness of the originals, we herewith give a list of the cast by Francesco in public museums, leaving out the more innocuous list of private collections, which are destined to sadden some future exhibition." End quote. While this viewpoint rightly encourages proper labeling, and we'll be talking about that today, it still leaves open many, many questions. What constitutes an original authentic Rosso, and where should meaning and value be located for posthumous casts? Is the work's originality and authenticity, and thus its value, found in the plaster models, the casts, or both? Does the existing definition of posthumous casts intend to imply that it is in itself a well-cast object or not, being legally authorized but not made or supervised by the artist? Is there a single standard of quality by which to measure these casts? Can there be a legal definition of quality? These are questions that came up in the course of my work. And I am hoping that during this conference, more questions will be generated from the experiences of art historians, curators, market operators, lawyers, and legal experts. Many public institutions and private collectors own cast by Rosso that are now considered to be posthumous. There's no scholarly or institutional consensus about how to label them, whether to display them or circulate them in exhibitions. Rosso's posthumous casts are frequently traded on the art market through intermediaries such as auction houses. Their attributions as authentic works is it sometimes avoided, um, sometimes questioned, leaving buyers with an uncertain sense of their status and value. This situation persists because Rosso's materials, casting processes, and his ideas about his legacy are not fully understood. Whereas the art market and the law demand from experts a clear answer to the question of authenticity and attribution, 
these casts cannot be limited to a binary question that we use for painting, whether a work is genuine or fake, either by the artist in question or not. A more nuanced approach is necessary, and my hope is that this conference will pave the way to such a more nuanced approach. Posthumous reproductions, as we know, have always existed. They go back as far as copies of Greek sculpture made by the Romans. However, the attitudes toward these copies have changed over time. The Roman copies of Greek sculpture were neither denigrated nor considered inauthentic with respect to the often absent Greek originals. At times, copies of later reproductions were thought to possess auras as strong as or stronger than the original, and we shall hear about that over the course of this conference. In the 19th century, copies of ancient and Renaissance sculpture were highly prized and placed in museums. And like others, uh, Rosso himself even produced such reproductions of past art, which he often signed with his own name. Today's negative views of posthumous caste is culturally conditioned and framed by a specific historical mindset. Um, its roots go back to the creation of a 19th and 20th century aesthetic that prizes originality and genius above all else. The new attitude was born as a reaction to increased mechanical reproduction during the Industrial Revolution, which dramatically improved the speed and ability to perfectly replicate and mass produce identical copies, and therefore put at serious risk the value of the artist's hand. Along with this reproducibility went the appreciation of a unique product, as well as a modernist aesthetic predicated on inimitability. This led to a reevaluation of posthumous casts, even in the case of the once prized Roman copies of Greek originals. In the authentication process of a painting, there are only two conclusions, original or fake. In the case of sculpture, which are inherently reproducible, the question is far more complex, as are the connotations of the word original. The general held notion is that lifetime casts are of greater market of intellectual, spiritual, emotional desirability because they were made under the artist's control, and there can be no argument with that. A problem arises when the word original is substituted for lifetime, or when original is used to distinguish lifetime from posthumous casts, since this implies that posthumous casts are not original and not authentic. Posthumous casts are seen in some ways as false representations of an artist's vision, and I'm sure we'll be discussing that from many directions over the next two days. Another problem with the word original is that art his, the art, art historians have repeatedly questioned the idea of an original in mechanically reproduced sculpture. Only the very first model made by the artist, for example, a subject first model in clay, can be considered the original. In sculpture, the first model is destroyed in the process of casting, more durable models in plaster from which to make the casts, so an original technically no longer exists. Authentic, the key word used in connoisseurship and attributions, presents problems similar to the word original. Authorized posthumous casts in some senses can in some senses be considered authentic, but according to what different standards? They're considered closer to the artist's vision than unauthorized casts or surmelages because they are taken with the permission from the artist's lifetime plasters. Authorized posthumous casts convey the artist's basic idea. The execution of the objects, materials, processes, finishes, and surface details may be very different. A further layer of complexity arises when posthumous casts are authorized, but the artist's intention for the posthumous work is not clear, and many papers will discuss this problem. Even if Rodin and Rosso permitted the posthumous casting of their works, it is not clear at all whether they meant them to look like the casts that were eventually made. Furthermore, in the case of Degas, where the artist expressed no clear intentions, one cannot know whether he intended his works to be cast at all. And the same applies to Boccioni and Daumier. Yet no matter whether there has been an expressed intent or not, posthumous casts exist. What terms to use about posthumous casts as compared to lifetime ones is left for later generations to decide. In this conference, we've tried to include a definition of these terms from diverse fields, even in the same panel. And you might find that a bit strange, but we wanted them to speak across disciplines. Art law and the art market use this terminology in very different ways. From a legal standpoint, when the artist has sanctioned posthumous casting, casts produced after the artist's death are considered to be just as original and authentic as lifetime casts. At the same time, and I quote, there are no harmonized laws in relation to the creation, additional casting, and selling of posthumous bronzes which leave an uncertain landscape in a legal context, especially internationally. And we'll hear more about that over the next two days as well. The art market adopts a more variable, 
and often slippery approach to these terms by loading them with value judgments. At certain times, the market exalts distinctions and depends on them to create an artistic taste, preferences, and greater economic value for lifetime casts, designated as authentic and original, over posthumous ones. At other times, it blurs the distinctions so that posthumous casts can be considered just as authentic and original as lifetime ones, and this is driven by considerations of economic value. Many institutions and catalog raisonnés adopt this ambiguous approach, and we've invited speakers from both worlds to share their viewpoints, again often on the same panel to encourage discussion. The public is caught in the middle. Historically, posthumous bronzes of work by Rodin, Degas, Boccioni, Brancusi, and Rosso have been highly appreciated by museum audiences without designation of difference. Today, museums tend to provide two sets of dates for posthumous casts, the date of creation of the subject of a model and the date of casting. But does this help the public understand differences between lifetime and posthumous casts in terms of materials, surface quality, and processes? Case-by-case -case analyses, as we will see today, have proven to be the best approach. Some scholars suggest that viewers should be encouraged to move beyond a strict judgment of inferior, superior quality. To paraphrase the curator and author John Tancock in a discussion of posthumous casts of Degas' work, the artist's hesitation should be balanced against the viewer's pleasure. We have with us today members of the museum world and hope that they will participate in this debate as well. Tate had several options upon discovery of Grandrios' posthumous status. It could have chosen to remove the cast from display, sue the dealer and or the family for not fully disclosing the cast status, or leaving the cast on display and ignoring this new information. What they decided to do was to strike a balance between public interest in seeing the work and awareness that the work is posthumous. It continued to exhibit the cast, but also publicly disclosed its findings by po um, posting a detailed discussion on its website. Tate refused to shy away from artistic and ethical issues deriving from this potentially damaging reattribution, instead making them an important part of the work's historical interest and offering the cast as a tool for further debate on the subject. In doing so, it paved the way for a new approach to naming, describing, and discussing posthumous casts. Its website entry demonstrates how the art market, institutions, and collectors can face the responsibility of clarifying to audiences just what kind of object they are looking at by stating when and how it was cast, by whom, and under what authority and conditions. Naming and describing um, transparently is an important first step to better understanding the complex identity of such works. The issue is as important for art history as it is for the law and the market. Some scholars contend that acknowledgement of replication, far from diminishing the interest the object holds for us, as we might perhaps fear, enriches their fascination. Tate's example is very significant because fuller disclosure can promote a greater understanding of the complex roles that posthumous casts play in artists' legacies. This combats insufficient or erroneous information, misattributions, and errors that continue to encourage dubious art market transactions. We hope to hear how this process can be supported or hindered by the law, which can establish who is entitled to make the posthumous casts, how many can be made in some countries, whether an artist's moral right has in any way been compromised by the appearance of a posthumous cast, and that full disclosure of relevant information is being made. Greater transparency has been recommended for a long time by the, catalog raisonnés, uh, the College Art Association, which issued a statement of ethical standards on bronze casting in 1975 and annotated in 2013. So we hope that this conference will help to go further and deeper. Perhaps, as I close, I can offer you one example of a team approach which I found very useful. In two studies I led on Rosso's process, and on a series of known lifetime casts, we observed visual differences between lifetime and posthumous works. Sampling of materials and 3D scanning led us to create a database of Rosso's lifetime casts with, with which a study of his son's casts can be compared in the future. Documenting provenance further helped us to make a distinction between lifetime and posthumous works. To conclude, I hope that today's and tomorrow's discussions will help us to better understand the role of posthumous casts. We shall also see how relevant these discussions are for contemporary art, from conceptual artists who appropriate earlier art for their work, to the people who in 500 years will be charged with recreating Solowitz wall drawings, to 3D printing. Katie and I wish this conference to generate more questions, wider discussion, and greater transparency of the issue of the afterlife of sculptures. Thank you.
So it is now my great pleasure to introduce our first panel. And uh, the moderator of this panel will introduce her panel members, but I'd like to introduce our moderator, who is Shana Larravee, director of the Hedda Stern Foundation in New York. Prior to joining the foundation in 2015, she worked as managing editor of the Isamu Noguchi catalog raisonné for the Isamu Noguchi Foundation and Garden Museum. She's also served as publication director for the catalog raisonné scholars association.